Welcome to the Workforce and Economic Development Subcommittee meeting. It, today is June 23rd, 2021, and this will be our last WED meeting for this term. And we'll see where we are in September. So here we go. We have a full agenda and we will begin. Uh, I call this meeting to order. Uh, do we have approval of the WED minutes for May 26, 2021 meeting? Move to approve. Move to approve. Second. I have a, a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, motion passes. I believe one item that I left out was public comment. Did we have any public comment at the beginning of the meeting? Chairwoman Pastor, uh, we do not have any public comments today. Thank you. I am now going to uh, move item number two to Councilwoman Stark uh, due to my closeness to this project. So Councilwoman Stark, take it away. Thank you. And this is really a pretty exciting uh, issue that I know um, our chairwoman has been working diligently on. Um, and so we have a very good presentation today. And I think, uh, Ginger, can you introduce who's at the table? Yes, you. Thank, thank you, Councilwoman Stark. Um, so we do have a very exciting item this morning uh, that, as you stated, is uh, near and dear to our chairwoman's heart, and that is on the <laughs> digital divide. With me here at the table giving our presentation is our Community and Economic Development Director, Christine Mackey. Also, we have Steen Hambrick, who's the Interim Information Technology Director for City of Phoenix, and then Paul Ross, who is the Vice President for the Office of Information and Technology for Phoenix Community College. And with that, I will turn it over to Chris to lead us in the presentation. Thank you very Great. much. Great, thank you. Thanks, Ginger. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, we are very excited to be here today to give you an update on our activities related to the digital divide. Uh, as you'll remember, uh, the City Council saw a presentation from this group back in October as we continued to move forward with our activities. We are, are so excited here today to share with you where we've come and our path forward. I did also want to introduce three members of the audience that are here with us today. Jason Jordan, who is the Network and Technology Services Director for Phoenix uh, Union High School District. I have um, a, a Tom McGreeny, who is the Interim Assistant Chief Information Officer for the City of Phoenix, and Ian Trollop, who is the Deputy Chief Information Officer and who oversees our wireless telecommunications staff. So um, as we lovingly call them all our partners in crime in this, in this tremendous program that we're working on. So as we look forward, I'll just do a, a quick refresh how we got to where we're at today. So as we all know, the pandemic really shifted our, our classroom learning from in the classroom to home-based learning almost overnight and caused the adoption of technologies to happen at light speed so our students could continue their learning. Those students without internet access were significantly challenged and not just normally, the digital divide has existed uh, for ages within uh, communities across this country, but the greatest challenge was those, ch uh, those students who don't have access to uh, telecommunications, internet access in their homes or other places would go to city libraries, to community centers, to senior centers, or even the Starbucks on the corner to do their schoolwork where they could get internet access. And as the pandemic began to rage, all of those facilities were shut down. And so they had no place that they could go for that accessibility. The pandemic has truly exacerbated and highlighted the technology gap that exists in areas of Phoenix. And that is really all the way from kindergarten through our university graduates. So that K through 20, uh, kindergarten through university, I, we're all affected. It wasn't just our, our early learning students, it was all of our students. And what we found working with our elementary schools, our universities, our community colleges and others, that even if, we're the, if computers were provided to the families, many could not connect due to lack of that, uh, that internet connectivity. So as we came up with uh, ideas to bridge the digital divide, 
what has been looked for across the country are creative solutions to connect students to their schoolwork remotely. So we all know the pandemic's going to end and, and is ending and we're going to go back into in-person learning, but what we've been looking for is a long-term solution. So just a quick recap on the things that have gotten us to today. You know, school districts and colleges, elementary schools, the city of Phoenix purchased hotspots and computers to get our students connected. Creativity, very creatively, parking lots and city buses, school buses were turned into Wi-Fi service areas to go into underserved areas of the community to be able to provide that connectivity. Uh, individual devices were purchased for students by Phoenix City Council, by our schools, by our community colleges, and by others. But what we continued to see was even with, the even with those devices, the digital service didn't exist for a number of homes. And groups across the country, this is not unique to Phoenix as we've talked about in the past, groups across the country are trying to solve this problem and provide for that long-term solution, not just the pandemic solution, but that long-term solution that remains a priority across uh, the country. So uh, I remember it like it was yesterday. Councilwoman Pasteur called me in May of 2020 and she said, Chris, we have to solve the digital divide. And I said, okay, Councilwoman, what are, what are your thoughts on that? And she laid out for me her ideas and her plans to bring the business community, city government, elementary schools, high schools, and community college together to see how we could really partner with the business community and solve this issue once and for all here in the city of Phoenix. So our team that was led by Councilwoman Pasteur explored a number of strategies and ideas and technologies to solve this challenge. We, we ran up against roadblocks, we threw ideas at the wall. Um, we like to say that no idea was too dumb on our meetings and being the economic developer in the room, Paul Ross, my colleague sitting to the right of me, will, will verify the silly questions that I asked him over the last 15 months. As we looked at this as a team, it wasn't just for our students. Our students are critically important, but as an economic developer in the business community, it's looking at that future workforce. We, uh, we've come so far in creating a workforce that's focused on the knowledge economy, but now that future workforce was at risk for those lost education years as the pandemic continued on, and how could we make sure that we had that future workforce? So I am so excited to tell you today that a solution to this problem has been identified. It has been tested by our elementary schools, by Phoenix College, uh, by our own information technology office, and the installation is underway in our proof of concept area. And it is a vision for a connected future, a long-term solution at an efficient and an affordable cost. It is a long-term benefit for all students across the city of Phoenix to start. So as we, we've talked about, we have our elementary school partners that are excited uh, and uh, our high schools and our colleges that we've talked about, Maricopa Community Colleges, in particular led by Phoenix College. To give you an update and, a, and a, a refresher on the digital divide, you'll remember at your May 14th, 2020 council meeting, the city council did authorize $2 million of CARES funding of the uh, coronavirus relief fund funding to go towards Wi-Fi connectivity and solving the digital divide. Phoenix Union High School District's board matched that funding with $2 million. Our two proof of concept schools, which is Cartwright and Alhambra, have also authorized funding that is now being utilized and underway in uh, the areas of the micro proof of concept and now moving into the proof of concept. And the intergovernmental agreement that City Council did authorize at your October meeting has been approved by all of the existing partners and will be brought to each of the school districts as we move into each of the school districts. So as you'll remember, our plan overview was to build a digital network infrastructure that is efficient, affordable, and easily accessible by our students. 
and in phases, we will cover all 250 square miles of Phoenix Union High School District. And I will tell you a quick funny, one of our team members as we were reviewing the, the, the PowerPoint presentation sent me a ping to say they thought there was a typo in the presentation because it did show 250 square miles and that was half of our city. Phoenix Union High School District does cover half of the city of Phoenix in its service territory. Now I'll remind you from our October presentation, while it is 250 square miles, 170 square miles really is the it, where our houses exist. The balance is either open space, it's industrial buildings, or other buildings that, that don't need this Wi-Fi connectivity. So we're really our goal is to cover about 170 square miles and then move into other school districts within the city of Phoenix and then provide our playbook to the county, to the state, and other states across the union. The plan uh, that we have worked on diligently for the last 15 months does close the digital divide for kindergarten through 20, kindergarten through our university graduates. But it is specific to connecting our residential areas back to their schools. The students will not be able to go surf Netflix. They will not be able to do Google searches. They have a secure authentication and connection back to their schools. Uh, we do have the support of the, of the cable associations and the telecommunications providers. They realize that we are not their competition. The city of Phoenix will not become a telecommunications provider. Instead, we will utilize support from their services in a true public-private partnership. And then finally, working through our community college programs, the goal is then to provide workforce training programs to service this technology and provide new, uh, new jobs for our citizens here in Phoenix. I'd like to turn it over to Paul Ross, who really is the architect of our solution and working in lead on the partnership with, with us, with the community colleges and Phoenix Union High School District. Paul? G'day and thank you for this opportunity to be before you today to share the model and to share what we have been doing relating to this particular project. The model that we've actually created is actually designed around building a wireless <laughs> canopy of coverage. And you'll hear that term as we go through today. The canopy of coverage is actually designed to be able to cover a large area, but also really focused on education and our partner sites, so leveraging our existing assets. There's a lot of opportunities that will come by utilizing this particular structure that we've put in place we will able to leverage the financial and the assets of the existing partners. We'll be able to leverage the support and the technology structures that we currently have in place across many of our colleges and our schools. And it actually has a area that we can reach into a, a very wide part of the community and to be able to leverage our staffing as I've just mentioned. And the partners are very diverse and we've got experience in providing these services over the last 12 months. So some of the outcomes that, have, that are directly tied to this. It is definitely a wireless canopy of coverage. It is designed and built for education and workforce efforts. We're leveraging our existing sites because our existing sites are actually close to the people and the communities that we are trying to serve. I'm just... And the existing, oh, sorry, working through this. The students are within the territory that we're trying to connect. And by using monopoles, for instance, within the school structures, we're able to be able to provide new infrastructure services for our communities and for our schools because they'll be able to reach into the areas that we have um, access into. And we also mentioned just workforce and training development opportunities as well. Coming July at Phoenix College, we'll actually have students working on an externship that actually is directly connected to this project. So the technology and the platform is actually built for education. We are designing a system and a platform with equipment that leverages our sites and that we also get to leverage the existing internet connections and broadband connections that the schools and colleges have in place already, utilizing many of the common carriers that we're familiar with. So we're actually building on top of enterprise and grade technology to be able to provide the service. 
we're reaching students to be able to connect to them within their home using secure authentication systems. Some of the photos that you see on screen there are actually some of the viewpoints that we have across the community when we're actually on top of some of the buildings that we've been able to access. And we're also building a system that is manageable and sustainable by the partners. The partners have a lot of different experiences and we can leverage those experiences for this project. In terms of deployment, the deployment process is phase one, which is the micro proof of concept that we've been working on, which is a technical uh, test and we've done reporting of good reliability and throughput that we've seen so far. So we've been testing it under real world conditions across multiple sites. Then we have phase two. Phase two is the full proof of concept area and that's a four square mile area and our planning and implementation is underway for that area. And phase three is a full deployment of coverage across the wider Phoenix area as Christine was mentioning before. There's lots of opportunities for this. The picture on screen that you have right now is an example of the broadband network where you can see interlocking and overlapping areas to be able to cover the area that we're talking about. But it is an educational broadband service. We are building it for education to be able to provide workforce and student opportunities. We're leveraging the partner's existing assets. We're building it for long-term support. This is not something that we're building for a short-term endeavor. We are focused on long-term solutions. We also are building the system to be able to support multiple technologies, so it's not locked into one particular technology, but it allows future growth and exploring other technologies as they come to bear. Now the whole system, once it's actually fully deployed, uh, will cover a vast area of Phoenix. And as Christine Mackey was saying, around 170 square miles of that area. But there's also lots of future potential development based on the platform that we're designing. That particular platform is a very adaptable platform and it's a platform that can grow. And so it will support future development in other areas to be able to connect others to the same sort of system and technologies that we're using. And it's a very flexible program. And I think I've just highlighted some of that. It's flexible, it's expandable, and it actually builds on the infrastructure. We're really focusing on making sure that we have solid infrastructure to be able to move us forward and move us into a long-term solution. So there's lots of efforts that are currently underway. This is not a project that does one thing at a time. This is a project where you have multiple teams working on it. We have an IT team that's made up of technology partners from the different districts who are connected to the project, and we've been meeting on a very regular basis to be able to go through the testing and the specifications and to be able to develop this. We also have a procurement team that's working hard on the procurement processes because the procurement is actually an area that is a challenge, especially with every, um, everyone coming back to work and also with supply chains. And we're also creating advanced mapping of all the different areas that we intend to serve. So we are doing the RF planning, we are driving the communities, we are mapping uh, using advanced tools from some very well-known providers, but we're also visiting the communities as well that we intend to serve. So we're actually driving those communities and walking communities and getting to know the areas across Phoenix. And lastly, we have the student, oh, the student piece, and that is in terms of student next steps, we will be collecting our student experiences and collecting data across the multiple project phases as we go that will actually measure and quantify the experiences that students have with the platform and with the infrastructure that we're deploying. Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, if I could uh, just go a little bit more in depth on that data collection. So uh, what Mr. Ross has done is he's mapped all of the census tracts that exist across the city of Phoenix and then has overlaid them with broadband internet connectivity and, and that, that the rate at which households have that connectivity. And so we have a, an incredibly unique set of mapping data that shows us where the students of the most need exist 
but secondarily where there is the least internet connectivity that these individual households has. So as we have, so uh, it is an incredible set of data that will allow us to prioritize the areas of most need as we move forward to ensure that the students who need that connectivity first are the ones that we work towards and prioritize in our future installation. So he's very humble, but it, I would argue that it's probably not data that exists anywhere else across the state of Arizona or the Southwest. It, it's something that is very unique to our project. So I congratulate him on, on being able to accomplish that. Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, as we look at next step, as I mentioned, our intergovernmental agreements are completed, but we will continue to execute them with each school district as they are added. The uh, final installation with the four square mile proof of concept is, uh, is moving forward. Just as a reminder, that is 59th Avenue to 43rd Avenue, and from Camelback to Thomas is that next, uh, is that next installation area that includes Cartwright, Alhambra, and Maryvale High School. Uh, it, again, as a reminder uh, to our viewers, it is a secure connection provided to the students. So there will be a technology of which that they move on to uh, connect just like they're in their classrooms and can easily uh, be on their Zoom, uh, you know, their Zoom lectures or, or complete their schoolwork. Our procurement process is moving and underway. Phoenix Union High School District does have the lead on that procurement and is continuing to move forward to get us all of the equipment that we need. Uh, as we look at our future installations, as I mentioned, we'll focus on the areas of most need, looking at that census data overlaid with uh, the uh, lack of connectivity that's there. I would also like to mention that our, our, our partners in crime that are all here with us have spent a lot of time up on roofs of city buildings and school district buildings and community college buildings assembling these assembling these, uh, these pieces of equipment in, uh, uh, I think Paul has a new degree in being able to climb ladders and, and, and do these installations on these buildings. Yes, we've had the uh, opportunity to be on the roof when it's been 110 degrees or hotter for an extended period of time, so Phoenix is hot. <laughs> And then, of course, we continue with our uh, we we can we continue with the, the governance uh, structure to main, to make sure that we ensure ongoing operations and support and maintenance. Uh, and so, just as a, as I was mentioning, the that a proof of concept four square mile area. The reason that area was selected to move to next is it is identified. As, the most, uh, as one of the top priority critical areas of need of students with the uh, lowest in our demographics on the census tract of our lowest socioeconomic incomes, but also in the, the greatest lack of internet connectivity that's in that area. And so that really does go to this mapping tool that, that Paul has created that has put us light years ahead of where we're at on other areas. Uh, also, uh, just as kind of a, another, it just popped into my head, one of the reasons we also selected that area, it's a very diverse uh, set of residential structures in the building. So there are very thick block homes, there are apartment projects, there's uh, mobile home trailer parks. So a really, it gave us a great opportunity, it gives us a great opportunity to test our technology in a very diverse housing portfolio. Paul, do you wanna share about your block house test? Yes, we were in, um, we've been doing some testing and going through different pieces of material for construction. And there was one particular location we were at and we were literally going through two concrete walls. The concrete walls are filled with concrete and rebar and we were still getting acceptable download speeds for broadband connections. And this was up to half a mile away from the base station where we were sending the signal out from. So some of those concrete walls have nothing in them. Some of them have lots of concrete and lots of rebar. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, again, we have a very broad group of, of team members, as you know, that have been working on this with our technology team from the elementary schools, from the high schools, from our city, from the community colleges, our attorneys that have worked to ensure that our intergovernmental agreement is in place and best serves our citizens, our business community, uh, and, and leadership uh, across the board. So again, uh, would really like to recognize Councilwoman Pastor. She, she's very humble and doesn't want to take the credit, but 
I do remember that first day in May that, that she, she called me and said, this is what we have to do in, in the next year. And she, in her role, she did bring everyone together to, to cause this to happen and has uh, been incredibly passionate about this project since its inception. So, uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, we would love to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Chris. Um, you know, education is critical to all of our children. But when the pandemic hit, it really became a challenge. And I, too, want to thank uh, Chairwoman Pastor for stepping up and making sure we could find solutions. I'm also very excited to see that in the future, we're going to include Paradise Valley. There is a community in Paradise Valley School District that's underserved called Palomino. And I'm excited about Washington Elementary, too, because there are areas of Sunny Slope that are uh, not served. Uh, very well. Are there any questions or comments? Councilwoman Stark, this is Ginger. I would just like to again um, thank uh, our Chairwoman Councilwoman Pastor for her work on this effort. I do want to also thank Chris Mackey um, for her work on this effort, hard work, right. as well as Steen Hambrick again from ITS, yeah. and then Paul Ross from Phoenix College. Uh, and again, to all of our partners for helping uh, meet this need, which is so very critical for our Phoenix students during this time. So thank you to everyone. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Of course, without staff, Council would not look so good. <laughs> we need you. We know you make us really shine. Any other comments? Well, then thank you. And I guess I'm going to turn it back over to the chairwoman. Thank you, Councilwoman Stark, for doing that for me. We are moving to item number three, uh, gaming compact. All righty, Chairwoman, on item number three, uh, which is gaming compacts, we have Lauren Armour from our Government Relations Department. Um, she's relations, Government Relations Manager who will lead this presentation. Also joining Lauren, if there are questions, are Jeremy Legg, Special Projects Administrator with our Community and Economic Development Department, and Thomas Stack, Attorney with our Law Department. And with that, I will turn it over to Lauren. Good morning, Chairwoman Pastor and members of the subcommittee. My name is Lauren Armour, as Ginger just so kindly introduced me. And today I will be talking about the uh, changes that were effectuated this year to the gaming compact that will impact the city of Phoenix. So um, this year, the Tribal Gaming Compact was, um, after a lengthy renegotiated, approved by Governor Ducey. Um, and, and the new Tribal Gaming Compact was officially approved in April. The new compact allows for an expanded game selection at tribal casinos, mm. including roulette, craps, and baccarat, as well as on-reservation sports betting and fantasy sports. Uh, as a companion to this bill, the legislature passed House Bill 2772, this bill was also signed uh, contemporaneously by Governor Ducey with the compact in April and allows, among other things, sports gaming uh, throughout the state of Arizona. It also permits online fantasy sports betting, um, it, and it uh, allows for 10 licenses for event wagering at sports books that will be run by professional sports teams, at least two of which could be held here in Phoenix, as well as mobile sports betting. Also permitted will be Kino, uh, a new addition to the gaming scene in fraternal and veterans organizations, racetracks, um, and off-track betting facilities, all of which will be run by the state lottery. Fantasy sports betting uh, was, was allowed under this new bill. Uh, it, was, it established a new chapter in Title V to permit uh, this new type of gaming. Uh, the new activities will be licensed and regulated by the Arizona Department of Gaming, ADG, which is required to adopt rules related to conducting fantasy sports contact contests and to establish penalties for violations. 
The age for participation in fantasy sports betting was set by the terms of the law, and that is 21. The Arizona Department of Gaming must also establish a fee for the privilege of operating a fantasy sports contest, and those rules are just coming down. Now, um, they're in the process of rulemaking, and the public comment period began on June 5th and closed just two days ago on June 21st. So those draft rules have now been through that comment, public comment period, and we're getting uh, toward the end of that process. Event wagering is also allowed by this new set of laws. Um, it also established a new chapter in Title V under Amusements and Sports uh, regulating event wagering. The Department of Gaming is also given the power and duty to enforce those statutes related to event wagering. ADG is authorized to issue up to 10 event wagering operator licenses. And that those license would authorize an event wagering operator to offer event wagering through the facility anywhere within a five block radius of the operator's sports facility, the physical location. Um, and it would also permit event wagering through a mobile platform. Those rules of exactly how that will work are still being put together by ADG, but um, there will be a mobile aspect to it as well. Um, and it should say as well that um, it has to be a professional sports team that, that holds uh, those licenses. So when it refers to a facility, it means that professional sporting facility. And ADG itself is required to establish and collect application and license fees for the purpose of event wagering. Uh, Kino is the last item that is allowed by this new law. An electronic Kino game will be run by the state lottery, but will be operated within authorized Kino locations, defined in the legislation as, as, as a physical facility with a specified gaming license. And that has to be a fraternal or veterans organization, a racetrack enclosure, or a limited number of off-track betting facilities. Um, and each of those locations will require geofencing to limit that, to limit play to personal electronic devices within their facilities. So there are some parameters set by the law. Um, just as a brief wrap up, these are state enacted changes that are coming to the city uh, that, that, that are going to have a significant impact on our current gaming, um, what, what's allowed in terms of our current gaming structure. It allows sports books to be open to professional sport uh, facilities within Phoenix. It allows Kino operations at a number of designated facilities within Phoenix, and it allows citizens to engage with sports betting from their personal devices. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions on this subject, as are my colleagues Jeremy and, and Tom from CED and Legal. Anyone have any questions? Uh, just one. Go ahead. Point of Point of clarification. So um, the Diamondbacks are in a county facility, but because they're in the city of Phoenix, we would still be involved, correct? Um, I think we will have, I, actually, I think that Jeremy may be able to speak better to this than I can, but I do think the city will have some involvement. It will be more limited with the Diamondbacks because of their role with the county. Okay. Thank you. So, Councilwoman Stark, uh, members of the of, of the subcommittee, uh, as Lauren had alluded to earlier, uh, there are two p potential sports books or event wagering facilities that uh, we know of that could be located within the city of Phoenix, located at the Arizona Diamondbacks facility downtown, and the city's arena downtown. Uh, the the state law authorizes both, and the city doesn't uh, play a hand in in any authorizations of those. Uh, however, the, so the city wouldn't necessarily have any involvement with the Arizona Diamondbacks uh, facility at Chase Field, uh, but you know, their uh, partner and you know, ongoing communications uh, are going with them. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question, and it's regarding the mobile piece. Who regulates that? Uh, the Arizona Department of Gaming is putting together all of the rules related to the broader rollout and infrastructure of those programs. There may be some areas that the Department of Gaming does not speak to, and those may be left to city regulation. Um, that's not 
perfectly clear at this time. It, it will depend on the issue, whether it's within our purview or gaming, whether they take up the entire space, so to speak. Okay, because I then my second question was going to then be who then regulates the geofencing and monitors it and makes sure that it is 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 happening because I know in the geofencing with the scooters uh, we monitor it and uh, <laughs> and that can be challenging at times. I believe that will be up to the individual operators under their licenses because this is a slightly different structure. The city isn't operating this through those facilities. The city, the facilities themselves will run those operations through individual licenses. That's for Kino specifically. Um, and so I, I, I don't believe it's specifically outlined in the law, but my um, expectation is that the license holders will be required to, to age those, you know, to enforce those requirements. But what if they're, okay, so then now you led me to a path of if those enforcers are violating and not enforcing, then then where does that go? I mean, these are just, you don't have to answer because I don't think you know, but these are the questions that are popping up as we're discussing. Sure, um, uh, Chairwoman Pastor, those, those, that, would, that regulation would be up to ADG. They, they're the ones who would make the greater rules who would um, and okay. then enforce them in turn. And then we would then we would get the rules and then read them and see if they're open or if we have any interpretation or if we have any ability. So the licensing specifically, which would, that issue of enforcement of geofencing is in the legislation and so would fall under okay. licensing, that would specifically be under ADG's purview and not ours. Okay, got it. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, everybody. I believe we don't have any public comments either. Chairwoman, we have no comments on this item. Okay, thank you. Now we're moving to theme parks. Uh, theme park district extension leg legislative update. Lauren, you're back again. <laughs> I am uh, Chairwoman Pastor, members of the subcommittee. I'll now present on House Bill 2835, theme park district's extension, uh, which was passed in the legislature this year. I'll provide an overview of the bill. House Bill 2835 was passed this session, as I mentioned. It extends original legislation that was passed in 2005, in which Phoenix partnered with the city of Williams to create a, the initial theme park district. That district sunset or expired at the end of 2020. Um, this new legislation authorizes the formation of a completely new district with the ability to issue up to $2 million in bonds. Those bonds will be funded by an additional transaction privilege tax of up to 9% on sales and income that comes in within the district. 20% of the bond principal will be funded by private partners. And this new legislation also um, takes the additional step of expanding the definition of theme park to include sports facilities. That is new for this legislation. The theme park district would have to be formed by an agreement between the Phoenix City Council and the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors. The district would be a municipal corporation considered a tax levying public improvement district. And the geographic boundaries of the district must be contiguous property that would make up the theme park site. So you can't have several different locations. The boundaries must be physically contiguous. The makeup of the governing board uh, for the district is outlined in the law. It would include four members total, one of each from the following categories for a four-year term. One member of the Phoenix City Council who would be elected by the Phoenix City Council under the terms of the law. One uh, Maricopa County Supervisor who would be elected by the Board of Supervisors. A member of the general public from Apache, Coconino, Mojave, Navajo, or Yavapai counties appointed by the Speaker of the House, and a member of the general public from Maricopa County appointed by the Senate President. The governing board is given certain enumerated powers under the law. It's permitted to levy a new transaction privilege tax of up to 9% within the district to pay off its bonds. It provides for the construction, renovation, redevelopment, and lease of properties and interests owned and controlled by the district. 
and it would be required to enter into leases in the interest of the district or to carry out and accomplish statutory requirements. So they're really the entity with full control over, over any district that would be formed. Um, that's my oh, fairly brief overview of this bill. Um, it allows but does not require the formation of this new, new district, I think is the most important thing at this point. And of course, I'm happy to answer any questions on this subject. Are there any questions? Councilwoman Stark. Yes, thank you. Um, so this looks and feels like it's gonna help the Diamondbacks out. Um, and and I, I'm not, <laughs> I, I don't really care either way, but um, the question is, is the 9%, would that then be put on a tickets or merchandise that's sold in the theme park? Any, any, excuse me, uh, Chairwoman Pastor, uh, Council Member Stark, any sales within the theme park district um, would would, okay. would yield that 9% uh, TPT or up to 9%, whatever it okay. ends up being set at. And so um, is there any other thought as to how or what might be out there as far as theme parks or sports facilities besides the Diamondbacks? I couldn't speak to that at this point, not that I'm aware yeah. of. Yeah, I'm just curious because in the um, governing board, it's uh, someone appointed from one of the other counties, so I thought maybe there might be something in the works. And um, Chairwoman Pastor, Council Member Stark, I think that, um, I'm opining a bit here, but I think that may be a holdover <laughs> from the prior iteration of this okay. bill that dealt more with those rural counties. Right. I remember Williams wanted to do some kind of theme park, and so, okay. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So my question, uh, it follows up with Councilwoman Stark's question. When we, or when a city or a rural community uh, designates a theme park district, then there's an additional tax placed on whatever that item is. I don't know what they'll call it, theme park. I don't know what they call that tax, but uh, it'll be in addition to uh, the tax that's already there. Chairman Pastor, that's correct. It would be a, a sort of a surcharge type of structure for, okay. for sales within that district. Okay, so it would be considered like a surcharge. And uh, that those dollars, uh, the purpose of the surcharge and creating the theme park district, uh, where does that money go? To the district? Yes. Surcharge. Yes, any funds, um, Chairwoman Pastor, any funds that were raised by the district under that 9% tax would go to the district initially to pay off those those bonds and then as revenue from that, from that point forward. Okay, got it. And then who makes the decision? Is it the, the group, the board that is designed? Councilwoman Pastor, Chairwoman Pastor, yes. Any any decisions related to the to the structure of the theme park or any any of those uh, fees would be subject to the board, the governing board. Okay. Got it. Understood. Are there any public comments? Questions? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much for uh, briefing us on these items and letting the public know about uh, some of the legislation that has passed, passed and uh, will be discussion and part of our city discussion. So thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. We are moving to item number five. Uh, Contract with Capital Cardinal Management for the sale and redevelopment of city-owned property at 723 West Polk Street. I do understand that we have uh, some public comments. Uh, we'll look at the presentation first and then go to the public comments. Chairwoman Pastor and subcommittee members, on this item we have at the table here our Community and Economic Development Director, Christine Mackey. We also have Zandon Keating, who is also a deputy director with Community and Economic Development, and then Cherie Boucher, who's housing manager, uh, housing program manager with the housing department. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chris. 
Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, we are here today to talk to you about the city-owned property at 7th Avenue and Polk. This is a property that was dedicated to the city in 1920 and is the home to the American Legion. As you will remember, City Council did give staff authorization to go out for a request for proposal to see what type of projects that we would receive back on this city-owned property. I think you will also remember we had a very robust conversation at that council meeting as to what was important to City Council and included in the request for proposal. Sandin is going to walk you through those items and the recommended proposer that staff is bringing forward today uh, for your consideration. Sandin. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. So I'll start off with a, a little bit of background. I'm, I'm sure you're very familiar with the site, but it's uh, located just north of the Five Points intersection of 7th Avenue, Grand Avenue, and Van Buren Street at 723 West Polk. It's a 1.68 acre site. Um, it is located within the downtown Phoenix redevelopment area and is currently zoned C3 and within two overlays, the art, uh, arts, culture, and small business overlay, as well as the Capitol Mall overlay. A little bit more background, of course, this is the site, current location of the American um, Legion. This was one of the first three posts authorized in the United States. There were three, all authorized at one time, all labeled as number one. So we don't know which one is number one, but this is certainly one of those first three um, in the United States. It was donated to the city in 1920 um, by a family who was operating a, a, a uh, we believe an ostrich farm on the site, and it was just a small uh, little farmhouse on the site at that time. Um, it was donated to the city for use as the American Legion uh, moving forward. Ultimately, the city then entered into a 99-year lease, which expired um, in 2019. Um, and then that, uh, just a couple years ago, city council authorized the, a lease extension uh, to allow the city to really figure out what we're going to do with the property moving forward and um, allow the Legion to stay in the property during that time. Um, we are also bringing a, an additional uh, lease extension to City Council on your July 1st uh, City Council agenda to um, allow the Legion to stay in the site as the uh, developer goes through their due diligence on the site, their zoning on the site, and also allows the, de the, uh, the Legion to stay there through their national convention, which is being held in Phoenix um, this August. So as Chris mentioned, um, we had quite a bit of, uh, quite a robust conversation at council um, at the uh, June 26, 2019 um, council meeting where uh, council ultimately authorized the city to release this RFP. So we wanted just for some background to go through the, uh, the items that were discussed and requested of council or of, of the RFP at that council meeting. The first thing is that the property could be redeveloped um, either through sale or lease of the property. Uh, that there was a requirement for a 99-year deed restriction um, restricting the property to um, affordable or workforce housing, certain pieces of, of the whatever uh, affordable or workforce housing was included in the site. Um, and then ultimately there was a minimum requirement of 60% of the housing that was provided be maintained at that affordable or workforce housing. I'll get in, in just a minute into uh, ultimately what is proposed in that regard. But then also that there's a, a preference within the housing uh, for veterans. So veterans get that first, uh, that first option at the housing units that are provided on the site. Um, also, that a minimum of 25 project-based Veterans Affairs supporting, supportive housing vouchers or VASH vouchers uh, be made available, and that uh, as many other VASH vouchers uh, that are available could also be used on, on the site. There was also a requirement that uh, a veterans organization uh, be provided space to provide um, services and support. Um, ultimately, in working with the Legion, uh, the RFP required 3,000 square feet, which is the, the space the Legion um, uh, uh, communicated to the city was needed in order to continue their current operations of, that, of the veteran support piece of, of what they do there on the site. 
Also, preservation of the current flagpole. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with their, their flagpole. It's, uh, if not the largest in downtown, in the downtown area, it's, it has to be one of the largest. It's well known by many of the neighborhoods and communities nearby. Um, also, creating a gateway element as this is a, a prominent intersection entering into downtown. Uh, this should be a marquee site that goes along with that. And then just a, uh, some extra points for any sort of uh, preservation that could be included of the existing building or elements um, on the site, understanding that uh, the entire building uh, was unlikely to be able to be saved. Um, that's not really what the Legion is looking for either. Um, and uh, so just any additional points that, that could be included with that. So go through the procurement process as well. As I mentioned, City Council authorized the release of this RFP um, in June of 2019. The RFP was ultimately issued on October 18th of 2019 with a proposal deadline in December of that same year. The opportunity was advertised on the city's website as well as in the Arizona Business Gazette. And the, the city also notified uh, uh, more than 500 um, individuals and organizations were registered for the city's development RFP email notification. There were two uh, minimum uh, qualifications that were included with the RFP. The first was um, experience. The, uh, pro the proposer ne needed to have a minimum of uh, uh, successfully complete a minimum of three mixed use development projects as well as one veterans or affordable housing uh, development. And then also that requirement um, for the uh, mixed income residential units, noting that a minimum of 60% of any proposed units need to be maintained at affordable or workforce housing levels, as well as that preference for, for veterans. So with that, uh, we're very excited to introduce you today to Cardinal Capital Management, who is the, uh, was the successful proposer on this, um, on this development. They're based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, they have developed approximately 10,000 units across the, the United States, and they really specialize in projects just like this that have some sort of affordable housing or workforce component, some, some type of income restriction. And they've also done a number of, of uh, projects specific to uh, specific groups like veterans organizations. So they're very familiar with, with this type of work. This developer is also working very closely with the Legion. They were working closely with the Legion um, uh, prior to submitting the RFP, so they knew really what the Legion was looking for and tried to craft their proposal um, to, to meet those needs. And they've continued to be engaged with the Legion, uh, very closely engaged over the last few weeks, uh, just to verify that what is, what is being proposed is, is exactly what uh, is, is needed and um, desired by the Legion moving forward. The Legion has also expressed um, to the city as, as well as to Cardinal that they are fully supportive of the, of the, uh, the proposal and moving forward with Cardinal Capital. So a little bit about the proposed um, project. As I noted, it is a mixed income development. Uh, 92 multifamily residential units are proposed on the site. 52% of those units would be uh, maintained or uh, reserved for uh, households that have a um, area median income of 50% or, 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 or less than that um, area median income. Uh, additional 24% would be reserved for households at 80% or below of that area median income. And then the final 24% would be reserved for individuals in our workforce uh, bracket, which is between 80 and 120% area median income. So 100% of the uh, proposed units on the site would be at um, some sort of income um, restriction. They would also uh, maintain that preference for, for veterans on the site. Um, the 3,000 square feet veteran support services uh, that was uh, required by the, um, by the RFP and what the American Legion communicated would be necessary uh, for their continued operations on the site. Uh, a 6,500 square foot memorial park socializa socialization space. This has changed a little bit through our, our outreach. Um, as we, when we first started this outreach, there was no requirement for a food and beverage option on the site. As we started working with the community, 
Um, we're becoming more and more engaged with the American Legion. Um, we found that that was something that was, was really uh, a desired um, piece for this development. And so this socialization space um, will likely include uh, a, what will be where they will ultimately locate a food and beverage option. It is going to be a requirement um, now of the, of the development moving forward. Um, also preservation of it, what, is, what is called the Memorial Hall as well as the existing flagpole. Uh, the Mo Memorial Hall is really that meeting space where the, the Legion currently has a number of their leading meetings. Um, it's a really beautiful space uh, on, the, on the inside of the, the building and they would be maintaining that space as well. Um, also an interpretive display documenting the history of the American Legion post number one. Understanding the, the site will change uh, the American Legion will stay a part of the development moving forward, but the site will change and how it looks will change. And so taking this opportunity um, to really document the, the last 99 years of uh, the American Legion's presence on this site and in central Phoenix um, moving forward, we'll see what the next 99 years brings. Um, and then, of course, as I just noted, incorporation of food and beverage services on the site, which again was, was something that uh, was changed from the, the initial um, uh, proposal as it moved forward. I should also note that while the American Legion is, is um, very engaged with Cardinal Capital, and Cardinal Capital has uh, communicated that they are the intended partner uh, for the site, um, it, we, the city cannot require that they maintain a partnership with the American Legion. We can't show a preference to one veterans association over another or one nonprofit over another. Um, but the, but everybody moving forward has been working in, in uh, good faith to make sure the American Legion has that space on this site uh, for the future. So some of the other uh, proposed business terms, um, I'll show you the, the site plan here first which shows you where that uh, American Le or the Memorial Hall, excuse me, location is. That's the existing site for that. South of that is where that uh, Veterans Memorial Garden um, would go. Likely would also include uh, that uh, the food and beverage space as well. Um, as the developer begins to get into the site, uh, you know, and is really fully designing the site. They'll, they'll determine exactly where all of that is going to go. This site will also need to be rezoned. It will need to go through the rezoning process. And so as, as the, the design progresses and, and we understand exactly what everything is going to look like, um, that all of those sorts of details, the parking on the site, exact bu building uh, placement, uh, those sorts of things will all be vetted through that rezoning process as well. And then you also see the, 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 the new building would go along the north and eastern property lines. That's where the 3,000 square feet of veteran support services would go. There would be office spaces within those buildings. And then all of the residential is also within uh, those areas. The purchase price for this site is equal to the minimum uh, appraised value and, and minimum purchase price in the RFP, which is $1.605 million. Uh, there would also be a required that required 99 year deed restriction guaranteeing the income restriction on the site as well as the preference for veterans on the site moving forward. It also provides um, access uh, in the in the term in the terms of public access to the Memorial Hall, the Memorial Garden. There'd of course be um, time restrictions, reservation restrictions, that sort of thing, uh, depending on business operations of the site. But the public would have access to uh, to those facilities. And then again, there's the 25 minimum 25 uh, vouch vouchers that would be made available for 20 years. Um, Again, these are the, the project-based VASH vouchers. The project can actually accept 48 VASH vouchers on the site, but we didn't want to tie um, those additional VASH vouchers as project-based VASH vouchers, VASH vouchers on the site because uh, we wanted to give veterans the, the ability to choose where they live. We, th we think that a lot of them will choose this location and, and uh, we will likely see more than that 25, uh, the minimum 25, but we wanted to leave it up to them to make those decisions. With that, I'm going to hand it to Cherie Boucher from the Housing Department just to talk a little bit about how this project helps out with some of our other city plans. 
Thank you, Zandon, and Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. As part of the Housing Phoenix Plan, the city completed a gap analysis, which identified 163,000 additional housing units needed in the city of Phoenix. Of that, 63,000 are regular market rate, and 1,000 would need to be for affordable and subsidized households at lower income levels. We have 9,000 units that would be needed for seniors, 5,000 for veterans, 9,000 for persons with disabilities, and 1,400 uh, 1, for persons experiencing homelessness. Um, the Housing Phoenix Plan included nine different policy initiatives, and that would help create 50,000 homes by 2030. The project that we're here today to discuss aligns with the third policy initiative that aims to use city-owned land for the development of mixed-income housing. Now I'll turn it back over to Zandit to complete the presentation. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about the public benefit uh, derived from the site. Of course, any, any project that we do in economic development, we always um, ensure that we're tying specific public benefits um, to the project and making sure that we're furthering a number of the, the other city priorities. Um, so, of course, there are those 92 mixed income units with a preference for veterans offered on the site. There's that $28 million investment um, in downtown Phoenix. There's the historical feature, the American Legion Post Number 1, the creation of that Veterans Memorial Park. Um, there is the community support service space that would be provided and maintained on the project, preservation of the Legion meeting hall, as well as the flagpole. And then there's always those jobs uh, in economic development. That's an important thing for us. So there would be 20 permanent um, uh, jobs associated with the site, as well as uh, approximately 100 uh, construction jobs. This project also had a, a very robust uh, community outreach process. Um, we ultimately met with um, four different neighborhood groups. Two of them were combined, but we met with four neighborhood groups. We also um, did outreach with two additional groups that are not on this slide, uh, Capital Mall Association as well as the Triangle um, Association to provide them information. Um, and then we also met with three additional um, city boards and commissions um, that are on this slide as well. With that, um, we ask for uh, your recommendation to move forward with a development agreement with Capital Cardinal Management. And we're available for any questions. Thank you. Uh, we can go to public comments. Thank you. Our first caller is Opal Wagner. Opal, can you uh, hear me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you, and it looks like I'm unmuted. Um, hi, this is Opal Wagner. I live at 330 West Coronado Road, and I'm keenly interested in this project, both as a member of the American Legion Post One Auxiliary and as someone who works on historic preservation issues for my neighborhood um, for the past few years. Um, I oppose this item um, on the basis that it glosses over, if not completely ignores, the historic preservation of this site. The um, building is the 15,000 square foot main building plus a smaller building totaling 16,000 square feet is all eligible for historic designation. The city of Phoenix is committed to historic preservation both through Plan Phoenix and Preser Preserve Historic Phoenix which was adopted by the city council in 2015. It sets a double standard when the city um, requires property owners to be vetted um, through the historic preservation process for eligible buildings. And here we have an eligible building with um, a major historical uh, significance, both, both to the city, but also nationally. It's one of the earliest American Legion posts in the United States. It's been, it's had um, functioned as the veteran services and community services continuously for over a hundred years. It's extremely well documented because each post requires its post to um, compile a history and all, all of those records exist. The item was submitted to um, the Arizona Historic Sites Commission for approval for the National Register. It passed, was vetted and passed. It was passed on to the State Historic Preservation Office for inclusion on the National Register of Historic Places. 
And all of a sudden it came to a dead standstill. I called down to the SHPO and, and uh, asked why this past week and talked to Bill Collins. And he told me it was because the CED placed a hold on it that they did not want it to move forward because of this, um, their desire to sell the site. So please do write by the historic preservation piece um, on this project. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marilyn Rendon. Yes, hello. Please proceed. Am I unmuted? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Marilyn Rendon. I live in Midtown Phoenix. Um, I would really appreciate what the council is trying to do in providing affordable housing. My suggestion or request would be that a redesign be done on this property with the apartments located on the west side of the lot, therefore preserving the entire American Legion Hall and parking. The historic um, designation should be given. If you do the project as the project is right now, you are signing the death now for that American Legion Hall it's a place that is very busy and used. It's a living, breathing place. And it really should be preserved. I've heard the comment previously that the veterans have received a sweetheart deal. And I just don't see anyone that's fought for our country having any kind of a sweetheart deal. They deserve this place. They use it. And you know, there are so few places like this left in the city that I really do wish that you would keep it and put it under consideration. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Beatrice Moore. Good morning, um, Beatrice Moore. I'm the director of Grand Avenue Arts and Preservation, as well as a small developer of historic and vintage properties along historic Grand Avenue and a resident of the district. This project has the potential to be an exciting, groundbreaking mixed use development with the additions and stipulation proposed by the Grand Avenue Members Association, of which I'm also a member, and we are completely in support of their proposal. In its current form, as proposed by Cardinal Capital, it is merely another significant site scraped of its historic relevancy to make way for another wall of generic apartments, even if geared toward affordable veteran housing. We support this veterans housing 100%, just not in its current form. Where is the space for a legion who has worked out of this site for over 100 years? What's being provided here is very minimal. Uh, we deserve an exciting gateway project at this entryway from downtown into the historic Grand Avenue district, a district lined with a significant vintage and historic building stock flanked by several historic residential neighborhoods, and it is a destination in our neighborhood because of its historic architecture, the arts, and small businesses. The GAMMA proposal, Grand Avenue Members Association proposal, does not divide, but actually brings several entities together for a win-win situation. The Legion, Veterans, Cardinal Capital, the Historic Preservation Community, and the City of Phoenix will be able to really uh, rally around this and embrace this project that will create goodwill and connection between all these entities. Please seriously consider the GAMMA proposal and the suggested stipulations, which are a must for assured success for this, for this parcel. Uh, just as an aside, I would like to have a question answered. I do wonder about the validity of an RFP crafted and then shopped around without accurate information regarding the historic preservation viability of the building on the site. Thank you. Our next speaker is Patrick Mays. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Chairwoman Pastor, Council Member Stark and Waring, good morning. My name is Patrick Mays. I'm a past commander of American Legion Post 1. I've been appointed by the current commander to make this statement regarding um, the proposal. Our post contains a long history of service, not only within the American Legion, but within the city of Phoenix. Each year, our post, through membership dues and other fundraising, provides funding for American Legion programs, such as Boys State, 
the American Legion Law Enforcement Career Academy, and support for the Boy Scouts. In addition, we have support programs that assist veterans in transition from homelessness back to, to a more stable life. We provide honor guard details for veteran funerals, and we contribute to the Legion's children welfare programs and support military families. And with our Legion service officer volunteers, we help uh, veterans navigate the process of filing claims with the Veterans Administration to secure their health and mental health benefits, along with disability claims. We have engaged with Cardinal Capital and city staff and stand prepared to be the Veterans Service Organization to be part of this public-private partnership to redevelop the land where Post 1 has been since 1919. We want to continue to be at this site, which is historic for our Legion. As you know, our national convention comes to the Phoenix Convention Center this August with more than 7,000 Legion members coming to Phoenix for the convention that elects our nat national leaders and determines our legislative policy going forward. We ask for your approval and support, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Graham. Robert, are you on the line? Robert, can you hear me? Uh, Mr. Graham, we are having a difficult time hearing you. Okay. Um, could you please try to reconnect um, and we will come back to you. Right now, uh, it's coming across as garbled. We can't hear what you're saying. So please um, try to reconnect and then we'll bring you back in. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ryan Boyd. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Or well, good yes. morning. Perfect. Thank you so much. Ryan Boyd, for the record, uh, I live at 1069 West Taylor Street. I can see the uh, amazing flag from my house here. Um, and uh, I'm in an interesting position here because as I, in general, support the uh, RFP in the sense that I think that this is a great site for affordable housing. And I think uh, Beatrice Moore put it well in the sense that there's a lot of great potential here. Um, if at all possible, it would be great to save the entire American Legion building. The American Legion is a good uh, stored in the community and something that should be honored. I, I think that the city uh, staff has done a decent job at trying to get there. Um, it's a challenging situation here. Here, RFP rules make it hard to communicate during the uh, issuance of an RFP to be competitive, obviously. And there's been a lot of uh, kind of false starts in the last year with some confusion uh, due to the pandemic, making it even harder for us to communicate among ourselves. So uh, in general, I just wanna highlight though, that this is very good to increase those uh, affordable housing units. This is actually one of the most affordable um, kind of scenarios. When we talk about affordable housing downtown, I'm usually sitting here looking at like 10, 15 percent uh, workforce housing instead of something that's actually truly affordable housing that's truly getting those lower AMI rates. And I want to support that. And I want to make sure that that is maintained here so that we can get more people into Grand Ave, get more neighbors down here and really build up. Because if we really want to have a, a dense kind of city, it can't just be skyscrapers in downtown and then single family detached homes as far as you can see. There needs to be more options in between so people can afford that. And I would hate to jeopardize that in favor of parking spaces, for instance. I think that there's a lot that they've done well with this. I think there's a few tweaks that could be made, uh, hoping to see that done. Thank you for your time. Robert Graham. Hello, am I coming through this time? Yes, sir, go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Bob Graham, as you said. Uh, my address is 351 West Portland Street. Right, so I live downtown. My office is also uh, uh, on Grand Avenue, uh, about a quarter mile up the street from uh, this project. Uh, I'm also uh, president of the Grand Avenue Members Association uh, and a historical architect, so I can speak to preservation issues on this. Uh, so we've been working with the Legion Post since 2017 as a part of a citizens committee. 
Uh, we assembled that committee uh, because everyone knew that this 99 year lease was coming up and we were we've always really been concerned with what the city would have uh, planned both for the, the site and the legion themselves. And uh, so that involved uh, quite a few of us. Uh, I come today in support of awarding this project to Cardinal because I know Cardinal has the, the, the what it takes to get this thing done correctly. However, uh, I think uh, the community, if I can speak for the larger group, uh, is very disappointed with the outcome of the plan on the table. Uh, and so we are recommending two stipulations. Uh, first of all, that uh, the council said as a matter of policy that the historical buildings on the site be preserved. Uh, their significance, as others have said, uh, is, is pretty well recognized at this point. Uh, secondly, that uh, the Legion uh, be, I guess you can't specify the Legion be a, the, the active uh, element. Uh, and I am encouraged uh, that the Legion uh, space, uh, I actually learned today that is 3,000 square feet of, of operation space, plus, as I understand it, the food operation, plus use of the Memorial Hall, which is a little better than I had understood, but this should be clarified, I think, uh, in council action. Uh, I prepared an alternative site concept uh, that uh, was emailed to all of you uh, yesterday. Hopefully you've been able to see that. But the, the intent of that was to just to show that it really is physically possible to accomplish what uh, CED wants to do with this project and what the city wants to do with this project uh, larger uh, and satisfy uh, the, the, the stipulations that we're requesting. Thank you. Madam Chair, that was our last speaker. There was one comment that was sent to one of the districts that they wanted me to read into the record, if I may. Dear Councilwoman Pastor, Councilwoman Stark, Councilman Waring, I oppose item number five, the proposed contract with Cardinal Capital Management for the sale of Lou Greenway American Legion Post 1 because it fails to recognize the historical significance of Post 1, one of the oldest American Legion posts in the United States, and instead calls for the demolition of most of the buildings. I understand that portions of the original 1920 era building and substantial remodel in approximately 1960 are worth saving, can be preserved, and can be incorporated into a redevelopment that could meet all of our city's goals for, for the area. I request that you either oppose item number five or include a stipulation requiring preservation of the elig eligible historic buildings. Thank you for your attention to this matter, Robert. That ends the statement. Councilwoman Stark. Uh, yeah, this I guess is a question for Chris. Um, I, I, you know, Robert Graham is a distinguished uh, architect, especially in the area of historic preservation. Were his stipulations uh, reasonable? Do you think we could comply with those? Madam Chair, Councilman Stark. Uh, thank you for the question. I had the opportunity to look at his letter this morning uh, about an hour and a half ago, and I think there is, uh, there's validity in his document. He is, yes. uh, as you put, a very respected architect, and yes. as I looked at it, I thought that, that there was definitely some validity and would appreciate the opportunity to, to have um, um, Mr. Graham meet with Cardinal and facilitate that meeting to see if there isn't a solution that incorporates uh, his his information uh, as I looked at it it on the surface to me it seemed very reasonable yeah. it, it sounded reasonable to me as well so if we could facilitate that meeting I think that'd be great um, again I, I have worked with Mr. Graham and he's quite knowledgeable when it comes to historic preservation thank you madam chair thank you um, my question to Chris one is uh, can this property retain it, his, its historic eligibility? Because what I heard uh, from Opal was that uh, they went to go and uh, do the historic preservation, and then there was a hold, which uh, this is my first time uh, kind of taken back that we would do something like that to a historic uh, building, knowing uh, we advocate uh, as a city 
for her historic preservation. So, uh, and when I say retain the historic eligibility, I don't mean one wall. <laughs> so, um, I would like to explore that or understand it. Madam Chair, um, I, I've asked Michelle Dodds, our historic preservation officer, to join us here to be able to answer that question. But if I might answer the reason that we, through the historic preservation office, requested that the application be put on hold was simply so that the opportunity presented itself to look at the property in its whole and then have our city council make the determination as the best way to maximize a property in observance of our veterans. So the intention was not to stop a process, it was to allow the process to fully play out so that the, the city council, once we had a recommended proposer, could make the determination of what they thought was in the best interest of the property related to our veterans. So I, again, there was no, no ill intention intended by that. It was simply to allow some time for um, the community input and the legion and, and finding a recommended proposer. So thank you for letting me respond to that question. And with me is Michelle Dodds to answer those questions for you. Uh, Chair, members of the subcommittee, I did a couple of weeks ago uh, meet at the site with the State Historic Preservation Office uh, representatives. Uh, the building grew over time, there were additions, and the question I asked of them is, would you still have an eligibility if you took it back um, to an er earlier period of time? And so they, they met, they didn't give me a, a specific answer at the time they toured the building, but subsequent um, conversation with them, they met as a staff and talked about it. And there, there is the possibility of removing some portions of the building and still having a building that they believe is eligible for designation and, and would support moving forward to uh, the keeper uh, in Washington, D.C. Okay. I don't know who I can make the motion or I don't know who's making the motion, but I, whoever makes the motion, I have some stipulations. <laughs> Debbie, you're on mute. Sorry. I said I was going to make a, a motion, but if you have some additional stipulations, I was going to suggest we incorporate the stipulations from Mr. Graham, but why don't you yes. go ahead? And make yeah, yeah. That's what I wanted to add the, the, add the two stipulations. Oh, okay. Then I'll make the motion adding uh, the two stipulations from Mr. Graham. Okay. And this may, is uh, may I just ask a question? I think I know the answer, but this doesn't prevent other stipulations from surfacing by the time it gets to the council, uh, full council, correct? I think that's correct. We, when the full council yeah. looks at it, they can still add additional yeah. stipulations. Yeah. yeah, we're not in a position to, I just wanted really more of the, the audience to know that. So, yeah. um, you know, we have some wiggle room, but I think this is a good yeah. start. So, uh, you know, if somebody's out there watching thinking, well, I'm never gonna, I didn't know they might, might potentially change. You still get another bite at the apple. I guess it's another so yeah. so. And Madam Chair, Councilman Stark, uh, just for clarification, there will also be an additional opportunity should the council choose to move forward with these stipulations. This property will need to go through a rezoning before it is transferred out of city ownership to any recommended proposer should the council choose to move forward or to accept that in the future. So a full zoning process would need to go forward on this property uh, should council choose to, to, to move forward with, with that option. But just wanted to call, this will be a, a multiple step process, not just, not just this council meeting and should you move it forward, the formal council meeting, there will be two subsequent council meetings and community meetings related to the zoning as well. in August. I have a, a question on this uh, motion. And I don't think we got a second. <laughs> I mean, I can, I can second it, I second. Um, in adding these stipulations now and uh, moving it to July, I believe it's set to go for July 1st. 
do we really need to be thoughtful about it and move it to our first August uh, date? Madam Chair, Councilwoman Stark, uh, I will I will leave that up to the subcommittee. Uh, there is is just gosh, what are we now? Eight days from the July first meeting. So we would want to ensure that we had ample time to make sure that we, we had opportunity to visit with the recommended proposer and to look at this very thoughtfully. Um, I would, you know, I, I, I would want to ensure that we were able then to get back to council, to, to these council members, to ensure that we've met the goals of your stipulation. So um, I'll look to Zand and I think that I, I, I I almost feel, and, and, and I apologize, but I almost feel like we should spend a little bit more time making sure that, that we can accomplish and accommodate for everything, and, and perhaps we are better to come to your August council meeting. It would give us a few more weeks with, with Mr. Graham, with, with uh, the Grand Avenue Members Association, and with the applicant to see if we can't come to a mutually beneficial conclusion that still provides the affordable housing for our our, our veterans and, and supports the goals of, of American Legion and, and comes forward. So I would I would agree with your request, Council, when that may be the better path to follow. And I believe our first meeting is August 28th, yeah. 25th. Let me check. Madam Chair, August 25th. Okay. 25th. Is that okay with the make yeah. motion? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Are we ready for a vote? Yep. Yes. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion passes three to zero. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that is the last item for the wet committee. Uh, and we're not sure what the wet committee will look like in September. So good thing we got that August date. <laughs> Uh, there are no additional uh, agenda items, and I am unsure if there's any public comment. Uh, Chairwoman Pastor, members of the subcommittee, we don't have any additional comments, public comments. All right. Okay. Well, everybody have a great summer and be safe. And stay out of the heat and drink a lot of water. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.